Just imagine you're back in 2009 and turning 12 years old in a few days, and your mom takes you to the fallen and never forgotten store, Toys R Us. And you go to the only section that really mattered at Toys R Us, the video games. Then you see a game cover of a dude looking like he's just living his best life. You have never heard of this game, you've never really seen anything like this, and you somehow, and I mean somehow, convince your mom to buy this rated M game with no context. Well, that was me all the way back in 2009, right around my birthday, which I think is probably why she bought it, but it was the same year it released back in 2009 somehow. But the point I'm trying to make is, I'm old, and the first time I played this was 14 years ago. Though this game was pretty revolutionary for me, because by the time I had this game, I had Halo 3, Gears of War, and others to keep me afloat, but this game somehow made it different from the bunch, and was extremely addictive too. At this point, I'm just living like my past self, because this was a staple game on the Xbox 360 for me, and for a good reason. I went into this game thinking it would be a breeze and mostly fun, but I soon came to remember how dumb the RNG is in this game, and just how tedious some of the DLC missions are. God, if you know, you know. But let me take you all through the journey of collecting the 80 total achievements, and why sometimes, doing some research on the games I 100% would probably make for a smoother experience. Nonetheless, let me introduce you and showcase my experience with the still amazing game, Borderlands 1. To begin, I started out ultra confused. There was a mysterious random other game called Borderlands Game of the Year Enhanced version, and I had a previous version called Borderlands Game of the Year. And after doing some research, I could actually import my previous saves into the Enhanced version and unlock some achievements automatically. So don't freak out because my achievement counter is already starting with eight before I even start the game, okay? But the good news is I would have to start with a brand new character nonetheless because the achievements I need to unlock require to beat the game, discover locations, and complete every single side mission. And that's exactly what I did. During my first day in playthrough, I was going to play a class that I didn't really use growing up, which was the Siren. I was more into the Hunter or Soldier class, sorry, but a couple of the achievements requires me to use every single character's action skill for 15 kills. So no matter what, I was going to have to level up these other dudes for a few levels. The first achievement I unlocked in this journey was for having friends. I got my first achievement for having friends. That's a big dub in my book, baby. Then a couple minutes later, I decided I was tired of having friends and thought it was only suitable enough to battle them in a duel and without taking damage too. And just so we're all clear with each other, the base achievements in this game are super easy, like brain dead easy. The majority of these are not missable and you'll unlock them while playing the game casually. So if it seems like I'm speedrunning these achievements, it's because I kinda am. Kinda like the next five achievements I obtained. I completed five missions in the Arid Badlands, which is the main hub and starter of the game, then a super easy achievement for discovering the Skag Gully location, another one for being an amazing teammate and reviving my downed group mate, and then using my siren ability to kill an enemy. Yeah, you have an achievement for killing a single enemy with it. I wasn't lying on how piss easy these were, and then I completed 15 missions in co-op. Yay for friends. But with the game throwing me easy achievements to unlock, the game excels with the humor or jokes with some of them. Like the next one I unlocked, which references the new Super Mario Bros. movie starring Chris Pratt as Mario with my brother as an Italian plumber. Yeah! <laughs> I like how there's been a lot of people not being able to get that achievement because they don't realize that the higher level you get, the harder it is to get that achievement. So to be the bearer of bad news for anyone wondering if this enhanced version had bugs and glitches, well, uh, yeah, it had a game breaking bug every 30 minutes or so. The enhanced version brings in good quality of life things, sure, like an FOV slider, more options, and some functionalities in game. But for some reason, the developers never fixed a big memory leak. It would legit happen out of nowhere and get increased by alt tabbing, which on PC, that should be the most basic thing to fix and get right. It honestly ruined a lot of my patience because it either happened fast or you would last an hour or two before needing to restart the game, reload, and invite your friends back. I have another big complaint, but it's not relevant for this instance right now, so I'll hold off until later. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Speaking of not missing anything, make sure to come check out my Twitch channel. I stream mostly every day of the week with some breaks in between, and I start my streams around 3 to 6 p.m. CST. I promise you'll have a great time and possibly make it into some multiplayer 
Firebase videos. Thank you for the wonderful support over there, but enough of that plug, let's continue. With the continuation of my first day, nothing crazy really happened. My viewers and I were just going through the game like usual, and to speed things along for you all, I unlocked a handful of achievements which included get a little blood on the tires for being a reckless driver, discovered Sledge's safe house, fence for selling 50 guns to a shop, master exploder for killing 25 enemies with explosive weapons, discovering the headstone mine, killing Sledge, which is one of our first main bosses, then unlocked the last core achievement for killing a boss with friends there are some who call me tim for using a class mod made in firestone for completing all the missions in the arid badlands pyro for using incendiary weapons paid a new haven discovering the scrapyard and crom's canyon and then the last two for killing another big baddie named crom and <sighs> Finally, 12 Days of Pandora, which wants you to get kills with 12 different guns and weapon variants to make a Christmas joke, which once again, I think is a stellar idea for having fun with achievement hunting. Oh, I got an achievement. Oh, brother, 12 Days of Pandora. Sex. I started with eight achievements immediately unlocked and got another 24 in this first day. How crazy is that? But to be fair, I did get extremely cocky at this point and thought this game would have only taken two or three days tops. But oh man, good old me and jinxing of myself was absolutely wrong. I had a plethora of long having achievements left and we're just getting started. In the start of my day two, I found out that Borderlands 1 has a random desaturation filter, which if you don't know what that means, Google says when the amount of oxygen bound to your hemoglobin drops below the normal level. Wait, what? Oh, my bad. Classic mistake. Desaturation is basically where colors become more towards the white or black color palette. In short, it literally means the colors look muted, muddy, or soft. And luckily on PC, someone found this setting called Use Legacy Desaturation and turned it to false. And bada bing, bada boom, we have brighter colors. Yay. Now to talk about this day two achievement grind, I had some viewers come in and out to help me complete the game, all of the base achievements, and to move on to the first DLC, The Zombie Island of Dr. Ned, which is an absolute stellar DLC. But just like day one, the base game was just pure unadulterated fun. I would start out immediately making $1 million. Oh, I earned a million dollars. One million dollars. I would sooner than later discover the trash coast by continuing the story, then get 25 kills with corrosive weapons, and finally kill this big animal boss called the Rack Hive. But to be honest, this looks like a, uh, well, I don't need to say what, you know what I mean, Arby's. At this point, I forgot to mention that the base game has a total of 50 achievements, which seemed to be the standard number back in the day for base achievements. Not complaining, but it's a big trend that is mostly forgotten nowadays. But this would mean I had 14 achievements left to beat the base game altogether. Immediately after killing the Arby's roast beef, I got the easily known reference to Back to the Future with 1.21 gigawatts for killing 25 enemies with a shock weapon. 1.21 gigawatts! I killed another boss simply named Flint, no not the Minecraft item, discovered another area, completed all the missions in the Rust Commons, discovered the final location at Iridium Promontory, and finally killed the very underwhelming last boss called the Destroyer. After killing the final boss of the base game, I decided to do the fun and missing miscellaneous achievements. I would first go for the rotenest, tootenest, shootenest, yeehaw achievement for killing 5 rack under 10 seconds. I raced around the ludicrous speedway in record time for the speedy McSpeederton achievement, then a totally forgettable game mode or side mode of doing battle in the Thunderdome with friends, can't we get beyond Thunderdome achievement, and then the last achievement that I would do for the base game would be a very, very quotable song and parodied song too, you're on a boat, which is by jumping on a boat, duh. Oh, and I would do the Tannis Easter egg by shooting all the barrels with their designated weapon variants to get this uh, interesting Easter egg. Oh, we did it. Oh, oh, oh my God. Here we go. We actually did it. Oh. 2009. All I can say is that is that is so 2009, it's not even funny. Now, with the base game basically done, other than these four achievements, which the level 50 one will be done with time, and the three other action skill ones will be done in the next few days because I didn't want to make a new character and wanted to continue. Don't flame me. But this is where my happiness and determination started to take the turn for the worst. There were four DLC releases and one title update to increase the cap to a random level 51. I like to play the DLCs with 
within games by the time they released. So I would start with Dr. Ned's Zombie Island, move on to the absolute worst DLC experience of all time with Mad Moxie's Underdome Riot, which I'll explain later on, then the vehicular usage in the secret army of General Knox, and finally, another interesting DLC called Claptrap's New Robot Revolution, ruined by my next complaint that I mentioned before. RNG. God, the RNG in this DLC made it absolutely terrible. Good God. It made me spend hours getting pieces for some of these achievements, and I still don't feel good even after getting the achievements, which I'll explain later on. In total, with all the DLCs put together, it would have an equal and even number of 30. So, to continue my second day progress, I went into Dr. Ned's first DLC pack and enjoyed all of it, mostly. This DLC pack is easily my favorite of the four, because the characters, scenery, and just atmosphere was top-notch, and it wasn't long to do. And I promise you all, I am not rushing this game at all. This was my second day, for God's sake. I was just enjoying myself and had enough time to continue. It only took me two hours and 25 minutes to get all the achievements and 100% the DLC. We killed a lot of zombies, some werewolves, and completed all of the quests. There were only five achievements in this pack and felt so short-lived for what could be expanded even more. But the five achievements that we unlocked were House of the Ned, which is simply unlocked for making and introducing Dr. Ned, then Jacob's Fodder to basically try and stop Dr. Ned's schemes, and then two achievements tied to the final boss, or should I say bosses, by killing Dr. Ned. You first kill regular Dr. Ned, and then get a mid-Marvel credit scene reference and needing to kill Dr. Ned again. And after killing Dr. Ned twice, we would start to do a tedious-ass quest line for collecting brains and feeding them to TK Baja. This achievement and questline would be just a hint towards what's coming up in the next DLCs. I thought collecting 435 brains all together for all five quests for the brains achievement was bad, but oh god, did I have no idea what was coming up. I would end my night spending the next 45 minutes-ish collecting brains after brains after brains after brains, and then lastly, collecting more brains to get the brains achievement finally. Yes, god, 6.3%. I don't, I'm not surprised it's 6. Point three. Oh god, you all know what time it is. It is time for Mad Moxie's Underdome. And for those that are not informed about this, this is one of the longest, tedious, and just stupid ass DLCs of all time. Let me explain. This DLC is just an arena survival shooter. Simple enough. Go through waves after waves after waves. Not bad, right? Well, you're wrong and stupid. I'm just kidding. But for real though, I spent 10 hours in one stream doing three arenas back to back. Three of them. So each of the big top three arenas all have 20 rounds you have to go through. Doesn't sound bad, but this is where it gets tricky. Get back, demon. I am a man of God. Get back. Each round consists of five waves, so 20 rounds with five waves in each means for each arena, you will need to complete 100 waves back to back to back. Each wave is different, but becomes the same by doing a starter wave, gun wave, horde wave, badass wave, and then ending with a boss wave. Ammo and health drop each end wave, and then weapons on different levels of rarity drop after the boss wave. And as rounds get higher and the waves start becoming numb to my brain, you also get mutations that change each wave by either giving you no shield, less ammo, low gravity, fast speed, etc, etc. This means the random mutations can either slow your game progress exponentially or straight up sabotage your game to almost end it. Because if your whole crew dies, you will restart from square one. And on average, going solo takes around three hours plus for each arena. And even though I had max level friends helping me by just speeding things along, it still took around two hours and 45 minutes on average bridge to complete them. Oh, and the big point here is that you can't save and quit. If you quit, you restart, so you must be dedicated all the way. First, you need to do these three arenas all the way to round five to unlock the round 20 arenas, which are the harder versions, obviously. You actually get an achievement for completing all the smaller challenges for the small tournament achievement, which is basically a participation trophy in this game, which finally unlocks the real test, Angelic Ruins, Hell Burbia, and the Goalie Coliseums. 
Each of these obviously have different layouts and are practically all the same because the difficulty rises as time goes on, so it didn't really matter what you begin on. There really isn't much to say about how dog shit this DLC was and the achievements tied to it as well. It was boring, long, and made me go insane. I seriously wouldn't have done this again without the help from my Twitch chat and the conversations we had along the way, so I really appreciated them for making it worthwhile when doing this atrocity. And speaking of achievements, there were only five in total, which the last four of them included beating every single bigger map once, and then a final one for completing all three of the bigger coliseums. It was absolutely terrible. God, it was so agonizing. And I'm not even fibbing or exaggerating for this video. I did not have fun with this. Doing the lesser five round challenges was the only time I enjoyed it because it was new, but after that, it became a chore and just painful. But being the psychopath I am, I took no breaks and just went after them, which triggers my very special and totally not overused segment called the Yoma Montage Time, baby. Because God have mercy, I could show you footage for days and it will all bleed together. So let's get past this once and for all and let me showcase you the most tedious and stupid DLC for Mad Moxie's under dome. Oh my god, 2.1%. I'm not surprised. God. Nine hours and 56 minutes. We hit sub 10. Continuing this fiasco, the next DLC wasn't all too bad. My biggest gripe was just the lack of fast traveling between locations. You will legit spend the most time just traveling back and forth to do quests, turn them in, and rinse and repeat. It's not a bad one at all, and includes the final final boss, Cromorax, so that's cool. I'd say this is like an average-ish DLC in my opinion. It's got some really funny dialogue between characters, but it's just really long as in how to travel around, like I said before, and just an eh. DLC. It's not worse than Mad Moxie's and Claptrap's revolution based on time and RNG, that's for damn sure. But to get this DLC out of the way, it included 9 achievements overall, which mostly involved doing main quests, leveling up to level 61, killing Cromorax, and a few other miscellaneous ones. And the ones I unlocked during the stream were making a monster for talking to Scooter and getting a badass vehicle, Athena out for rescuing Athena, Depot demolition for destroying the Lance Depot, which meant I beat this DLC main story in less than three hours, which seems kind of fast if you ask me, but continuing on, I got speed kills for destroying a Lance vehicle with the little racer car, and then sneaky little buggers for killing the little dudes. And so we killed some little dudes that carried loot, and one of them was an extremely high level named Meat Popsicle. How nice and wholesome. That's him! Yes! I had to end my stream earlier than usual because I unfortunately had some terrible news. And not to be sad or make anyone sad, but I lost one of my family dogs named Mac. He was an adorable boxer that was taken away from us early because of cancer. And all I want to say is that if you guys have any pets, dogs, cats, anything, make sure to hug them or love them for me. It was pretty rough and a big reason why it took me a while to get back into making content and why I got some of these next achievements off stream and only recorded without a camera. And my community on Twitch and Discord all were fine with it for probably obvious reasons, but I managed to get max level on my Siren character by joining one of my viewers playthrough 2 games, and he helped me out by letting me join in on some killing sprees. I unlocked the Ding champion and over leveled achievements by reaching level 50 and 51 respectively by being on my own and selling medkits a lot. Then as I said before, I joined my dude Renegade and he helped me get to that higher levels and beyond for the Ding over level to 11 achievement for reaching level 61. It was extremely nice of him to do because 
means I could have grinded them myself after a while, but he was available and it just speeds things along. And technically, I didn't cheat because this is a feature to join in on some friends and other players. And I would need to get the level 69 for the Cromer X fight as well. So I just played with him for around 30 minutes or so and just kept killing the same things over and over. This would make it a total of 64 out of 80 achievements. We are getting closer to finishing this game. So this next stream would be my last gaming session of Borderlands 1. Initially, it took me around 13 to 14 hours to finish the game and beat DLC 1. And at this point of the streams and progress, it was summed up to be around 33 hours. I spent more time doing two DLCs out of the four to just get to this point and means that I did less time doing the main game too. <sighs> God, I'm so excited for Borderlands 2. But I started my fifth and final stream doing the last three base 50 achievements. This included doing the Hunters, Soldiers, and Berserkers action skills with 15 kills each. Super easy, and I seriously wanted it out of the way to not worry about it anymore. I went back into DLC 3, or General Nox's DLC, and cleaned up the two out of the three remaining achievements. I say two out of the three because I didn't know that there was a secret achievement in this DLC for visiting and paying a tour of the world's largest bullet with the name Sucker Born Every Minute, which I'll explain later. And the two remaining achievements that I went back for were Vincible for killing Cromerax the Invincible and Completionist for completing all the missions in the DLC. Cromerax was a tough son of a bitch, and I later came to find out that no matter what level you are, he will always be three levels higher than you. So when I went for max level, which was 69, nice. The son of a bitch was level 72 and absolutely destroyed our asses. But to our prevail, we nailed the crawdad and got all this dog water loot and then easily did the last remaining quests for DLC 3 and obtained the completionist achievement. Claptrap's revolution was a really cool concept for the story and characters, but the moment you go for the achievements, you will soon come to find out that the biggest problem of this is the RNG. With Mad Moxie's DLC being long and tedious for doing the same thing over and over for hours, Claptrap's revolution decided to do the same thing, but make it a collectathon. Out of the 10 included achievements for this DLC, 6 of them are literally achievements for collecting parts or looking for things in these dumbass quests. Now let me tell you something that's really jacked up. When Borderlands 1 originally released with this DLC later, the RNG was still super terrible for the items like the underwear, fish, pizzas, oil cans, and scrap metals, but they were somewhat balanced to a degree. Like one of the achievements, the Lubricator, yeah this game doesn't hold back on the name schemes, but originally the chances of these dropping were increased because you need 25 of them. Makes sense, right? Well, when they did the enhanced version, someone or something legit messed with the drop rate of this item and made it almost impossible to grind this out legit while playing this DLC. And during my playthrough of this DLC, I got so fed up with how little I was getting these, I had to google what the deal was and oh man, did I open Pandora's box because everyone that was playing the enhanced version on PC or console were complaining about the same thing. So everyone decided to find a grinding spot at the end of this DLC to just be able to get a a chance of getting these, which we'll get there. First, let me catch you guys up on these achievements real quick. Claptrap brings back a bunch of old bosses you killed in the previous DLCs and main game, and you get achievements for killing each one, like General Nox, Ned, and Commanded Steel. She was the last boss that got killed by the actual last boss, the Destroyer, which brings us to the last, last boss of this entire game, and 100%ing Journey, with the interplanetary Ninja Assassin Claptrap. And oh man, did the pain and suffering begin. Tannis, another Borderlands character, wants us to collect a lot of scrap and other things for her collection of sorts. And while I was going for her stuff, I managed to get the five 3D glasses for the It's So Realistic achievement, and soon after turn in the items to Tannis for the collector achievement as well. And by the way, just getting those two achievements cost me an hour of my life because the spawn rates of these clap traps that you're supposed to kill sucks major ass. So I had to quit to the main lobby and load back in to get better spawns. It was honestly annoying and only gets worse, which you're about to see. I unlocked the really easy achievement called Tourist, or Tourist, whatever, for finding all six Claptrap statues. Then the real grind comes in. The last three achievements in this DLC were for collecting three panties, five fish in a bag, and 15 pizzas for the What A Party achievement, then collecting 15 Claptrap bobbleheads for the Bobble Trap achievement, and finally, the Lubricator achievement for those pesky and terrible drop rate oil cans. And to be the bearer of bad news, Again, I spent almost four hours doing this exact same strat over and over and over and over and over. And it's a pretty simple strat 
as well. Destroy the turrets on the boss. And just stand in front of the opening door and it will spawn enemy claptrap for you to kill over and over. That's pretty much it. If you wanted to get more into statistics, the door spawns one at a time and will throw another one out immediately after one dies. I, on average, killed around 10 to 15 each time. Each claptrap has a chance to drop all of those listed items from before. This strat was supposed to help, but to reiterate, the drop rates are terrible. Someone over at Gearbox fucked up, plain and simple. You would have a 0.0001 chance of getting most of these items while playing the DLC regularly. So thank God for the heart and sheer willpower of gamers and achievement hunters alike for finding this god tier grinding spot. At the end of the night, and hours of punishing myself with killing claptraps, I managed to get the 15 bobbleheads first, and for shock value, the Xbox percent equivalent is a shocking 1.21% for the bobbleheads. Then I managed to collect the panties, fish, and pizzas for the What A Party achievement, which has a 1.16% on Xbox, and finally, 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 with a 1.19% unlock ratio on Xbox, I got those damn oil cans for the lubricator achievement. And after all that pain and suffering, I ended out my session by going on that worthless tour to see that world's largest bullet to lastly and finally end our journey on 100%ing, platinuming, and achievement yes. hunting Borderlands 1. Yes. Boom. 80 achievements, Borderlands is done. Man, oh man, what a ride. To continue your journey, check out my Left 4 Dead 1's achievement grind. It was another long inducing grind, but this time by killing a lot, and I mean a lot, of zombies. But if you happen to enjoy that wild ass, RNG ass, and tedious ass journey of Borderlands, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps a lot more than you think, and make sure to check out my Twitch channel at Yoma97. I stream mostly every day of the week, starting around 3 to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, and I hope to see you there. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.